Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Making movies that fit together versus making movies that stand on their own. Today, we're going to look at what impact Marvel's cinematic universe is making on the industry and find out if audiences are suffering with sequel fatigue. And later, a brief history of today. We'll take you to an exhibition which is raising tough questions about the contentious, unsettled times we live in. But first... Paintings for the Future, a little-known artist's exhibition in New York shattered records, 75 years after her death. And Pretty Picture, Dark Subjects, tackling the big issues at the Sony World Photography Awards in London. This year's edition of the Sony World Photography Awards was bigger than ever. Each of the 10 categories, from documentary to architecture, showcased the best in contemporary photography shot over the last year. The jury has spoken and this year's awards were handed out. But as showcases Miranda Atti discovered, one theme kept popping up again and again. Powerful images confront you in every room of Somerset House. There are the female boxes of Goma and Yuck, a visceral series of foods, like an image of what looks like bubblegum on toast, to England reimagined. But time and again, the photographs on show allude directly or indirectly to our environment. And the themes that I think you pick up on running through are a lot of environmental work um, and a lot about identity. Environment is absolutely vital. And I think we're starting to show good work there that relates. We have interesting things about disability, um, as well as some interesting artwork, which is rather surreal as well. So I think we've got a, a massive range of subjects, but there are themes that people will pick up as they go through, I hope, and think, think about on each story. Yan Wang Preston won the landscape category with her series, To the South of the Colourful Clouds. She's taken pictures showing the ecology recovery and transformation of this corner of Yunnan province, China, from a rural to an urban space. The ecology recovery is actually applied everywhere, but in this region, what's special is it's so visual. Like even you and I can see that it's been done. Um, so the project, this series is actually part of a much larger project called Forest. So I have a book here to show you. Um, and Forest really uh, talks about the reconstruction of nature. Now we are actually making land. We are making a, a desired landscape that we think is better than the original one. There were more than 320,000 entries to the awards this year. The judges whittled that down to 800, which may only be a tiny proportion, but in reality that's enough images to fill Somerset House's East and West Wing galleries. And over in the West Wing is the work of Federico Barella, who scooped the top prize, overall photographer of the year, as well as $25,000. His series, Five Degrees, tackles the issue of male suicide amongst farmers in Tamil Nadu, India. Here, environmental issues and mental health collide. The work of Nadav Kander, who was the 2019 Outstanding Contribution to Photography recipient, fills the East Wing. There's his portraiture, including those of Barack Obama and Julian Assange. And then there's his estuary series, which again focuses on landscape and environment. Works are communicating subconsciously with you, and I try to frustrate a viewer slightly so that they are, so that they care to look for longer and possibly have a relationship with that work. And a relationship is always two-way. 
So you become the author at that moment of the meaning of a photograph. So there's a triangle, there's myself, there's the estuary, and it's only completed when you enter the picture, look at it, and breathe meaning into it. Some of the images are ethereal, some are confronting, all say something. But some of the most powerful are those that remind us of the urgency of action when it comes to the environment and climate change. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. Anytime a museum smashes attendance records, it's usually for an exhibition of a well-known name, like Andy Warhol or Picasso. Which is why this exhibition at New York's Guggenheim Museum has become the talk of the art world. With more than 600,000 visitors, Hilma Afklund, Paintings for the Future, became the museum's most visited exhibition in its history and also sold the most ever catalogues. So, who is Hilma Afklund and what did she paint that was so significant? Showcases Hatija Maryam Galger explains. She is a trailblazer and a pioneer. And while the world may not have been ready for her art then, 75 years later, the Swedish painter has blown attendance records at the Guggenheim. When Hilma Afklund started painting radically abstract paintings in 1906, they were little like what had been seen before. Her work predates well-known figures like Kandinsky, Kazimir Malevich, and Piet Mondrian, proving that Western modernist abstraction was not an all-male endeavor. Hilma Afklund created more than a thousand paintings and works on paper that she kept private during her lifetime, believing that the world was not ready for her art. But now an exhibition of nearly 200 of these paintings has proven that idea wrong. It seems that Hilma Afklund's moment has come. Let's delve deep into this record-breaking Swedish artist's uncanny and exquisite creative world with art critic Jason Forrest. Jason, we've just heard that all her life long, she thought that um, the world was not ready for her art. What does this mean? Well, her work came from a very different point of view than the kind of Western Christian background. Uh, she was deeply connected to the spiritualist movement, which started shortly before the beginning of the 20th century. And as a result, um, she started to really embrace and uh, explore concepts that were kind of beyond the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I mean, sounds like the world is ready for her now, uh, looking at all the attention she's receiving. But why are we only hearing about her now, 75 years after her death? Well, it's a fascinating story. So uh, when she passed away in 1944, she left roughly 1,300 paintings and about 125 notebooks and journals. Uh, but a will left to her uh, nephew, Eric Ofklint, which expressly, uh, expressly forbade the family from uh, exhibiting the works for 20 years. Uh, the family was frankly overwhelmed with this massive archive. Th they literally had a giant storage uh, uh, container or, or warehouse full of artworks that were completely undocumented. So it took them actually a little bit longer to actually have their first exhibition of her work in 1986. Of course, in 2013, she had a kind of breakout show at the uh, Modern Museum in Stockholm. And then now we've finally gotten it today. Um, so I think the other issue, which is really interesting, and, 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 and challenging about Hilma's work is because it was expressly forbade from being viewed, uh, she wasn't on anyone's radar. She definitely came out of the blue, but why did she get this much attention at the Guggenheim, you think? I think that's also part of the, a part of the fascinating uh, aspect of Hilma's story, which is effectively her work looks so fresh today. Uh, she is a woman that comes uh, before a lot of the, again, Western art history narrative. Uh, uh, and then, but the work is so appealing, right? We see the work, we can tell that it is, uh, 
Uh, it feels like it's abstract art. It's, it's very bright and colored. It has geometric symbols, uh, but it's filled with symbiology so that you want to actually uncover and get inside of all these bits and pieces. But yet, the fact is that no one heard of her before. So when we think about art, we think about modernism starting with Kandinsky, Mondrian, uh, the artists in the Bauhaus. Um, but then here's a woman that basically did it uh, four years early that simply nobody knew about. So it's a compelling story. And what do you think about the spiritual side of her art? It's very uh, prevalent, isn't it? So I think that's the most important part of Hilma's work. So uh, as a young woman, she became uh, interested in the spiritualist movement. Uh, this uh, has a kind of an academic arm called the Theof uh, Theosophical uh, Organization. They created a lot of academic texts that uh, referenced the changes in science in the 19th century. So, for example, the uh, invention of the X-ray, the first photographs of uh, snowflakes. Uh, they became interested in what they called uh, sacred geometry, which is effectively kind of a theory that kind of underpins all the world. And the Theosophists were fascinating because they took this emerging science and they blended it with, they basically filled in the gaps for, um, with very poetic means for things like what is an atom? And that's one of the things that Hilma also did a lot of drawing and thinking about what is an atom? It was something so small that the sciences couldn't actually see it. So this gave kind of uh, an opportunity for the Theosophist and Hilma in her work to really, I don't know, take artistic license with it. Um, this spiritual side though is actually really fascinating as well because they take things like color and science and mix it in, a, in, a, in what we would see as almost a strange way with a lot of Christian and also non-Western religious beliefs to create this thing that is definitely talking about the astral plane, about the spiritual realm, but it only plugs in with our traditional understanding of, of religion mm -hmm. in kind of interesting and slightly strange ways. Mm -hmm. And some say that she's Europe's a first abstract artist, even before um, Kandinsky and Mondrian. Do you agree with that? So this is where I don't agree with it. So Kond uh, uh, Mondrian and uh, Kandinsky specifically were, were exploring uh, their tools, paint, drawing, sculpture. They were specifically exploring what is a line. Kandinsky wrote uh, many volumes about the basics of, of, of uh, design, uh, the fundamentals, what is color, how do we use color and shape to tell a story. Uh, uh, Klint actually was, was visualizing abstract concepts and putting them into her work in a way that was geometric, uh, that involved this color. And so it's easy to see how a uh, abstract paint, a painting of an abstracted orchid with maybe a color spectrum mixed in could feel like an abstract painting. But in my opinion, she's actually visualizing something that is just hard to understand uh, in uh, 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 she's visualizing something that's hard to understand uh, as a discrete item. Mm -hmm. Well, this is very interesting, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have uh, Jason Forrest, Art Creek. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you. Still to come on Showcase, marveling at another box office blockbuster. You could not live with your own failure. Where did that bring you? Back to me. Mega budget superhero epic Avengers Endgame to the top of theaters worldwide. Where is humanity headed? We visit a digital exhibition in Istanbul looking to answer this question and many more. But before we bring you those stories, here are a few others making headlines. And on today's lot, we have a few stories about those that made history in their own ways. Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? Say you never ever leave from beside me. And the winner is Canadian rapper Drake, 
who stole the thunder at this year's Billboard Music Awards, taking home 12 new trophies and breaking Taylor Swift's record for most awards of all time. Named top artist, Drake has now chalked up 27 awards. Meanwhile, Mariah Carey received the Icon Award and BTS got two prizes, including the fan-voted top social artist. Up, hold them up, hold them up, everybody! At the same time, hold them up! Stars of American sitcom show The Big Bang Theory made history outside Hollywood's TCL Chinese Theatre. This is the first time any TV actors have left their handprints in cement. The show, which debuted in 2007, ran for 276 episodes, making it the longest-running sitcom of all time, beating out Cheers. Everything about this is so far from anything I've ever done before and so different. And a sneak peek at Somali-American model Halima Aden, who has become the first Muslim model to be splashed on the pages of American magazine Sports Illustrated Annual Swimsuit Edition, wearing a hijab and burkini. Aiden returned to her birth country of Kenya, where she posed for the magazine. The much-awaited swimsuit edition of the publication, which has been going since 1964, will hit the newsstands on May the 8th. One of Hollywood's biggest and most envied studios is back, doing what they do best. As expected, Marvel Entertainment's biggest superhero spectacle ever, Avengers Endgame, has a massive international debut, to the tune of $1.2 billion. The superhero ensemble flick broke more than a few records, including biggest opening day gross, biggest global opening weekend gross, and biggest market share. So what does this kind of massive success mean for the future of movies and movie going? Now to weigh in about Marvel's impact on the film world, film critic Sean O'Connell joins us. Sean, great to have you with us today. So let me start with this. These days, most blockbusters are part of a franchise. Do you think we're all prequel, sequel, cinematic world fatigue? For some people, I'm sure, um, but the box office numbers definitely suggest that these are the types of stories that most audiences want to come to, and it's certainly the types of properties that studios feel the safest investing in. You know, every once in a while, a filmmaker like Jordan Peele comes along with a movie like Get Out or Us, and they're able to sort of break through and do something original. But more often than not, when a non-franchise film tests the waters of the box office, they struggle to put up the numbers that we see uh, when you look at the box office for properties that are established, like Marvel, like DC, like The Fast and Furious or Mission Impossible. So there's a reason why all of these prequels and sequels exist. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about Marvel's impact on the movie industry in general? They have a pretty um, unique style, I think. They really do. And what we've seen over the years is other people try to duplicate it and, and fail, basically, fall by the wayside whether it's um, Tom Cruise's The Mummy trying to launch a dark universe um, of films that got announced but will never come to fruition, uh, to just across the street, you know, seeing DC Comics try to do the same thing with their Superman, Batman franchise and launch a very hastily put together Justice League. Only Marvel has been successful enough at taking the time and the energy um, to build a franchise over the course of 11 years and 22 films, which is why when I look at what Endgame was able to accomplish from a storytelling point of view, it's truly miraculous and not something that I think we're going to see again. The Marvel blueprint and the way that they've approached this has been completely unique, and I just don't think other people are going to be able to copy it. Mm -hmm. And all these like franchises, sequels, prequels, comic books, I mean, how much room do you think these leave for original movies? Well, that's a great conversation, and I think that's why we're seeing the rise of more interesting uh, and challenging films going to streaming services uh, like Netflix and Amazon as they start to uh, expand their scope of uh, theatrical and film distribution, because the multiplexes are dominated so much by these major franchise properties, and on a weekend when something like Avengers Endgame opens, it devours every available screen. Audience members are now almost being trained to go find um, 
interesting offbeat non-franchise content in, in different outlets. And thankfully, the industry has outlets like Netflix that have risen up uh, to the point where they can um, release original films, uh, establish uh, relationships with filmmakers and storytellers. The likes of Alfonso Cuaron and Martin Scorsese, who are now doing their films for Netflix, because it's become very challenging for them to get their projects into the multiplex. And this is definitely changing the industry. But then how do you think the audiences are changing? I mean, do you think their expectations are limited to a particular style? Well, I, audiences are, are starting to expect serialized storytelling from their blockbuster franchises. And that's become, uh, because of Marvel, because of Star Wars, you go to a movie expecting to see the next chapter of a much larger story the way that you would at a television show. If you followed something like Breaking Bad or Lost or people who are following Game of Thrones, take Game of Thrones as an example. The audience is so sophisticated now that they get what's essentially an independent feature film delivered to them every Sunday in an 80 to 84 minute runtime, that's unheralded for a television show and the production value is so high. It makes it really hard for a show that doesn't have that budget or doesn't have a showrunner who's committed to that level of quality uh, to deliver when you, television used to be the place where you just got like sitcoms or hour long dramas that were contained to their story. Now the audience expects much bigger stories that interlock, uh, interlock and interconnect and tell bigger uh, epic size uh, scope scale stories. And I don't know that's fair because it's not sustainable. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have today. Film critic Sean O'Connell, thank you so much for this. Thanks for having me. we see our world if we could view it through the eyes of an animal who lives in the forest or even the smallest of microorganisms and what does the future hold in a time where new technologies are developing at such an alarming rate these questions and more are being probed as part of an exhibition not far away from our studio with swirling colors and immersive game rooms, Istanbul's Akbank Sanat has opened its latest exhibition, The New Human Agenda. This digital exhibition reflects on living conditions and politics of coexistence in our time, not only among humans, but also in our relation to other ecosystems. That was one particular question that we found inspiring, that is what the humanity strives for today, and, um, and also sort of comparing what it was yesterday, what is tomorrow. So we brought together a number of artists that are speculating about uh, past and future, or the way they look at the past and reconstructing the future, uh, perhaps the base of their work and uh, the artists who are using new media technologies and uh, dealing with uh, how the artificial intelligence for example is is perceived today or what it is what is the ne next goal in today's uh, environment the artworks on display come from diverse backgrounds from japan's team lab to turkey's refik anadol the artists create a discursive podium interrogating prevailing power mechanisms and what the future may hold. I think that the sense of the future has changed. We used to think of the future of like 100 years from now, or even 50 years from now, but because technology has really accelerated our daily pace, I would argue that we need to start thinking about the future a year from now, five years from now, because we really don't know what will come new uh, because the changes have been so quick. The exhibition questions this thinking of the future and tries to answer to what extent these technologies can be employed for a cultural, economic and ecological change in the era of Anthropocene, where humankind has caused mass extinctions of plant and animal species, polluted the oceans and altered the atmosphere. Every generation has its challenges. Uh, but I think to a great extent, it's really living in our present today. I come from a country where everybody is obsessed about making America great again. And the question is, what is that America? You know, is that America of 
uh, the 60s? Uh, is it the America that was established on freedom, but yet at the same time was enslaving black people and where Native Americans were dispossessed and died by the millions? So which is the past, but also what's the future in terms of who's invited into that future? So can artistic and scientific research be mobilized to create a balanced relationship between humanity and nature? And most importantly, can we cope with the potential toxic side effects that come along with these great technologies? Only time will tell. We've reached the end of another episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Thanks for joining us. If you're looking for more of our coverage of the global art scene, you can find it on our YouTube channel. See you next time.